Beloved, let's say the unity prayer just for our safety. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Beloved, let's pray together Psalm 126. You can say it after me, line by line. Psalm 126. Sometimes it's entitled, Joyful Hope in God. Joyful Hope in God. Remember, the Word of God is a two-edged sword, and we Catholics, we need to use the Bible more, don't we? We have to use it more. And I suppose after the great warning and perhaps the chastisement we're going through, we may be forced into shelters or refuges, and we'll have nothing more to do than to pray the rosary and read the Bible. And finally, Catholics will become Bible reading. <laughs> so let's do this one together. It's really apropos for today and uh, for what we're going through as a church and as a nation, as a world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved, would you say these holy words after me, line by line? When the Lord delivered Zion from bondage, It seemed like a dream. Like dream. Then, was Then was our mouth filled with laughter. On our lips there were songs. Our lips, there were songs. The, heathens the heathens themselves said, What marvels the Lord worked for them. What marvels the Lord worked for us. Indeed, we were glad. Indeed, we were glad. Deliver us, O Lord, from our bondage. Deliver us, o Lord, from our bondage. As, streams As streams in dry land. Those who are sowing in tears, Those who are sowing in tears. Will, sing will sing when they reap. They go out, they go out, full of tears. Carrying seed for the sowing. They come back, they come back full of song. Carrying their sheaves. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You're a very obedient crew, <laughs> very humble. I, I want to now give applause to Jesus, not to me at all, but to the Lord. Let's give the Lord the applause, the worship that he deserves.
Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Viva Cristo Rey! Viva la Virgen! Viva la Virgen! Viva la Virgen! Viva San Jose! Viva San Jose! Viva San Jose! Alleluia! Isn't God great? Isn't it good to be Catholic? It is the greatest privilege in the world. Amen. Let's just thank God that we're Catholic. Alleluia. Well, you must be, I hear the spirit in my spirit saying creme de la creme. Because <laughs> you're experiencing really what is true. As the darkness gets darker, the light gets brighter. Amen? Yeah. Thank God we're on the right side. Amen? Amen? Thank God we're on the winning side. But it's true, as the dark gets darker, the light will get lighter. And Our Lady said to me three times today to say this to you. She said to tell you, prepare yourself for miracles. Amen. Amen. Prepare yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So as it gets darker and darker, you know what I mean, more satanic, more vaccines, all of that. <laughs> The brightness will get brighter, and the miracles will, it will expand exponentially. And Our Lady whispers to me that every Catholic family that is faithful will be receiving miracles in their living room. Amen? In their living room. Two. As we were applauding the good Lord Jesus, and, and only he deserves applause, you know what I mean? Only the Lord, really. As we were applauding, Our Lady gave me a limited vision, but as you were applauding and we were facing the good Lord, I saw the Hindus and the Buddhists. I saw Hindus over here and Buddhists over here. That's what's coming. The whole world will be touched by the flame of love, and the whole world, including our Muslim friends, will become faithful Catholics. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I I've shared this story in Philadelphia before, but let me share with you again, just in case. You know how Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, Venerable Bishop Sheen, how he said that one day the entire Muslim world will become Roman Catholic through Our Lady of Fatima. That's quite a prophecy, right, from, from a very recent saint and a very intelligent, learned saint. The entire Muslim world will become Roman Catholic. And I remember um, after 9-1-1, that terrible episode in our, in our nation's history, I was preaching in Texas that week, and I didn't even know about 9-1-1 at first because I don't watch television. I hate television. I hate it. So I don't watch it. My brother, who's also a missionary priest, had to call me from Central America to tell me what was happening in our country. <laughs> he called me from Central America and said, Jim, did you watch the television? I said, no, Anthony, never. And he said, well, you better turn it on. And that's when I found out what had happened that morning. In fact, my little sister, our little sister Maria, was actually there. She was working in a building in um, Brooklyn, 
and she could see clearly what was happening. And I'll never forget Maria's testimony. They saw the first plane crash into the building. And then the whole crew was there stunned. Her office team, they were high up in some building there. And they all went back to their desk after about half an hour. My sister just remained glued to the window pane. She couldn't move. And so she was there watching as the second plane came out of nowhere to hit the second building. So my little sister saw it. And of course, she was, um, it was very, very disturbing. That's what Maria is very intelligent, of course. And she said, that's when I knew it was an attack, not an accident, but an attack. And Maria was so concerned because her best friend, besides her husband, her best friend actually worked in the Twin Towers. And a very good young man, he also was from Tampa, Florida, where we all were born and raised. But now Maria is living in New York City with her husband and her family. And she's there. She sees this happen. And she knows her closest friend is there. And her closest friend, I, I met him once or twice at family gatherings, but um, really was not a Christian believer, but a very good-hearted young man and very diligent, always went to work. And Maria was weeping, and she, she, she couldn't get hold of him. You know, the cell phone traffic was so intense, you couldn't get through to people. And so Maria was crying, and she told us that her friend, let's call him Brian, uh, Brian never missed a day of work. In fact, in, in more than 20 years, he had not missed one day of work for any reason. Not one day in 20 years for sickness or any other reason. So Maria and her husband were trying madly to get hold of him. They could not get through. The buildings collapsed. It was a terrible situation. And then about 5.30 that afternoon, Brian called my sister. Because Maria broke down and wept. It's very emotional. He said, Maria, I can't explain it. Because he's never missed work once, not even been late once in 20 years. She said, he told her, I woke up late this morning and I missed my bus. So I was late. I was traveling there when the planes hit. It's the first time in 20 years it's ever been late. Do you see how even in the midst of tragedy, the one true God, the God of love, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are still present working? Amen. And of course, we're in the middle of another 911, so to speak. I, honestly, you know, in, in the White House, I would call that one big 911, the White House right now. <laughs> we're in the middle of quite a tragedy. But remember, the Holy Trinity is still present to you and I. Amen? Amen. And this is how God makes saints out of us. This is how he purifies you and I. You know, as, as the saying goes, Saints are not made out of cheesecake and ice cream. Maybe more out of broccoli and rutabagas. <laughs> the saints, uh, they have to carry the cross. Amen? And now, of course, we always, that's why you need Mother Mary in a particular way, uh, because as my little brother used to say, Father Tony, he said, Mary is the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. <laughs> Remember that famous song? Yes. So she's the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. So if your cross ever gets too big and too heavy, always, but always turn to Mary. And she'll give you a little sugar. She'll make the medicine go down easy. Amen? Amen. And so Bishop Sheen prophesied that even the Muslim, in fact, he said the entire Muslim world will be converted to Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith through Our Lady of Fatima. So when I was preaching in Texas that week of 911, of course, every priest experiences across the nation that the churches were full Monday through Friday, all during the week, overflowing at every mass. Some people were going to confession, thanks be to God. It was full to overflowing, but one thing I noticed, and I'm sure my brother priest noticed it, is that the people appeared to be frightened. It wasn't exactly a peaceful gathering, the masses. It wasn't exactly explosive with joy. The people seemed to be scared. And you know, when you're a preacher, especially if you're a pastor for more than a few years, a shepherd, 
then you can pick up on that real easy. You know what's happening? People were frightened and scared to death. And that brought me to a conundrum as a priest. And here's why. Because I had read all the prophecies of the saints. And as a child, my favorite reading material would be the lives of the saints. That's what I would love to read. And I read what the saints said. And a whole plethora of saints, even Louis de Montfort and Mary of Agreda, said that all of the Muslims would be converted to Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Canonized saints have said this. So Bishop Sheen is just the latest in a long line of wise and holy men and women. So I went to the Lord in prayer, and I, I said to the Lord, Lord, I, I don't understand it. I really didn't understand it. Why are your people afraid? I don't get it. Here was my thinking, and I expressed it to the Lord. I said, aren't you the one true God? Aren't we your sons and daughters? Why are we afraid of them? Should they not be afraid of us? Shouldn't they be afraid of us? Because you are God, and we are your adopted sons and daughters. It's like you had a big brother who is six foot eight and 400 pounds. And somebody attacks you, and he's only four foot seven and 78 pounds. You say, hey, have you met my big brother yet? <laughs> it's kind of like that with the Muslims, and they, I didn't understand this, why we were afraid. And so I asked the Lord, Lord, I know what your prophets have said. Lord, I want to ask you for permission to preach this at my masses. Because that's called private revelation. It's not public revelation. However, if it's approved by the bishop and if it has an imprimatur, then you can use it in mass if it's approved by the bishops and the cardinals. So I asked the Lord, please give me permission to speak about this. Your people are too scared. Would you give me permission? Lord, give me a sign, I said. Give me a sign that you want me to preach about this because... I never hear anyone talk about this. No priest, no deacon, no bishop. I never hear anyone talk about this. In fact, it's politically incorrect to speak about bringing a Muslim to Jesus. Now, here's my thinking. If you love the Muslims, you introduce them to Jesus. If you hate them, you keep your mouth shut. That's my understanding. If you love a Hindu, you bring them to Jesus. If you hate them, you don't tell them anything about Jesus. If you love the Buddhist, you bring them to Jesus and his mother. If you hate the Buddhist, don't talk about Jesus. Do you get my drift? Yes. I did not understand. I, I never, ever hear, even now I don't hear about it. It's like it's against the law to talk about the mandate that the Lord gave us, to preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. So I asked them to give me a sign. I need permission from you, Lord, to speak about this and your protection as well. Now when you're a faithful priest, that's when you're in danger. If you're impure and you know me heretical, you got it made in the shade. If you're faithful, look out. Amen? But I have one advantage over some of my brothers. I live in the heart of Mary. I live in Mary's immaculate heart. And so in Mary's heart, in her flame of love, is the greatest safety there can be in all of Philadelphia, in all of the world. Amen? Amen? And so if you're not living in her heart, you want to live in her heart beginning today. True devotion to Mary doesn't mean just loving her or praying to her. It means living as she lived and living within her heart. Amen? So here's a little prayer in case you're not doing this. Let's do it now. This little three-line prayer was written by St. Louis de Montfort and recommended by Pope St. John Paul the Great. And it goes like this, a way to recommit or consecrate yourself to Jesus through Mary. Are you ready? Okay. It's very simple. Would you say this, written by St. Louis? I am all thine, Lord Jesus. I am all thine, Lord Jesus. And all that I have is thine. Through the, Through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to do it again in the plural because we're a family. Are you ready? Yeah. We, are thine, we are all thine, Lord Jesus. And all that we have is thine. 
through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. One day, every Protestant, every Muslim, every Buddhist, every Hindu, every atheist, and everyone who works for CNN will be saying that prayer. <laughs> one day, everyone will be saying that prayer. Let's do it one more time. I am all thine, Lord Jesus. And all that I have is thine. Through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Alleluia. So now you're consecrated whether you like it or not. <laughs> and feel free to use that to renew your consecration every day. John Paul said that renews your consecration, to do that every day. Well, I'm asking God for a sign that I am to preach about approved private revelation. And what happened was, is that I had to go to Florida after about a week. I was in Texas. I had to go to Florida to preach at a wedding in Tallahassee. So first I flew to Tampa, Florida because my mom was there. And like a good priest, you always visit mama first. Amen? <laughs> Just like Jesus when he rose from the dead. I'm sorry, I love you, St. Mary Magdalene, but I'm sorry, Jesus went to visit mama first. All the saints have said that. All the mystics have said that. He went, Anne Catherine Imrich said it. When he rose from the dead, shortly after midnight, on that Sunday morning, he went straight to his mother's house. He knocked on the door. She said, come in, son. <laughs> she was ready for him. She had the hot tea and cookies right there on the table waiting for him. She knew that he would rise. Mama knew that God, Jesus, her son, would rise. No doubt whatsoever. When the Lord knocked on the door, the teapot was whistling right then. She was ready. Amen? Amen. In fact, you know that some of the mystics said this, that our Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be his holy name, that he rose from the grave earlier than was expected because the power of Mary's prayers, the power of Mary's love, literally drew his body out of the grave. I believe this. The power of her love and her prayers was, it was so mighty that the Father could not hold back. He let Mary's prayers go right into the tomb, and her love and her pulled him out of the grave. He awakened even earlier than expected. Amen? Yes. Our God is a God of serendipity, <laughs> a God of surprises. Amen? So, I asked God for a sign. I went to visit my mother in Tampa. And then my, my driver, a good friend, a family friend, picked me up at 12 noon from my mother's house, Friday noon, and drove me to Tallahassee from our family house in Tampa. That's about an eight-hour drive. So Hubert drove me from like 12 to 8 p.m., and we went to Tallahassee where there is the co-cathedral of St. Thomas More. The co-cathedral of St. Thomas More. There on the campus, more or less, of FSU, Florida State University, and so we have the wedding there the next morning. So Saturday morning I arise and did our prayers and went over to the cathedral. And I said mass with another priest, believe it or not, he's a tall, a tall man who plays basketball and his name is Father Mike Jordan. <laughs> That's actually his name. He was a very good basketball player, by the way. And so I, went, I said mass with Father Mike Jordan. We had a few hoops. We hit right through the hoops right there during that Mass. We were, we were batting for the Holy Spirit. We had a wonderful Mass. Father Michael was older than myself, so he was the main celebrant, and I was the homilist. And we had a, a beautiful time. It was a joyful Mass. And the church was packed with FSU students. And Father Michael and I both knew the bridegroom. That's why we were there. And his beautiful bride was there. And they had quite a wedding party, like approximately 10 bridesmaids and groomsmen, about 10, all wearing those beautiful tuxedos, you know, beautiful. After Holy Mass, after the wedding, someone drove me to the country club where the reception was taking place. So I get to the country club, and it's, it's really splendid. It's quite beautiful. And I ask the man who's attending to me if I could walk out into the gardens, because people were swamping the country club and I wanted to be quiet for at least half an hour. 
especially after I minister or preach, I have to get away from all voices, including my own, and just listen to the voice of the one who fills me with life at every, every vowel that he speaks. He fills me with life. I have to hear his voice. If I hear his voice, all is right with the universe. If I hear his voice, I'm standing on a solid foundation. If I hear his voice, my Father from heaven is loving me through his word. If I hear his voice, I'm ready for anything. Amen? Amen. And so I went out there for half an hour just to pray quietly and to listen for the voice. Let us listen to the silence together. Amen? Amen. And so I'm all by myself, and I have something in my hand. I forget if it was a cup of coffee or a glass of red wine. I forget which one it was, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm Italian, so it could have been either one. <laughs> but only one glass, believe me. I forget what it was I was sipping on when somebody, I'm all by myself, and somebody taps me on the shoulder from behind. Now see, now it's Saturday midday. I was at my mother's house the day before Friday. And at approximately midday in my mother's house in Tampa, Florida, I had knelt down in a spare bedroom all by myself, and I asked the Lord to give me a sign for to preach about the coming victory and how even the Muslims were not to hate them, we're not to be afraid of them, but we are to pray for their conversion. Amen? So I asked God for a sign that I preach about this. Now it's, it's about 24 hours later, I'm eight hours away in Tallahassee, which is the capital of Florida. The wedding is done. I'm at the country club outside, enjoying the silence, the beauty of the garden, and the presence of God, our Savior, when somebody taps me from behind. And I was, I was shocked because there was nobody out there with me. I was suddenly was tapped, and I turned around, and there is a young man who's one of, of the, the groomsmen, wearing that beautiful tuxedo. It was one of the groomsmen. It wasn't the bridegroom who I knew personally, but it was one of those FSU students, like 10 of them, they were all groomsmen. They had the same tuxedo on. He came, he, he tracked me down. He went out, he tapped me on the shoulder, I turned around, he had dark olive skin. And he put his hands like this. And he bowed like this. Who does that? Muslims do that. He went like this. And he said to me, Father, I really enjoyed that mass. I enjoyed that wedding mass, Father. He said, Father, I'm Muslim. Now remember, I'd asked the Lord the day before to give me a sign if I'm to preach like I'm doing right now to you. He said, I've never saw the boy in my life. He was one of 10 students from FSU. I didn't know any of them. I couldn't even see them that well from the high altar. He's up to me, tasked me, I turn around, Father, I really love that mass. I'm Muslim. But I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I haven't said a word yet. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I'm looking at him like, whoa. <laughs> but God, he always answers our prayers, does he not? When they're real and they're sincere, he always answers them. And so he said, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he said, but Father, I said, yes. He said, three months ago, I was baptized and received into the Holy Roman Catholic Church. I mean, out of his blue, he said that to me. He couldn't have heard me in my mother's bedroom eight hours away in Tampa. <laughs> I was asking for confirmation of Bishop Sheen's prophecy that the entire Muslim world will become not just Christian, but Catholic Christian. Amen? Amen? He said to me, three months ago, I was baptized and accepted into the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And then he said this. Talk about the icing on the cake. He said this. And Father, he said, I said, yes. He said, and I'm the happiest man in the world. And I said, no, you're not. I am. You're number two. <laughs> no way, Jose. 
You get the consolation prize. I'm the happiest man in the world. Amen? Is God great or is God great? Isn't that amazing? And the Lord says to share with you, you are my brothers and sisters. I'm no better than anyone here. We are brothers and sisters. He will also answer your prayers, and he will give you signs and wonders as well. If you speak